So the host has muted all of us and only the panelists can unmute themselves. Uh, the attendees can uh, drop in a question in the chat box. Let me welcome you to the 87th edition running of Thursday Musings. Today's topic is comorbidities, a challenge for psychiatrists. And we have none other than a very senior faculty of ours who will be introduced shortly. Next slide, please. Uh, let me welcome Professor Dr. Tufan Pati, sir. He's from Katak. He's so well known that he, uh, that I'll, I'll skip his slide and I hope he doesn't mind. Sir, over to you. Thank you, Alim. Thank you, Amrit. They are the two moderators, vibrant moderators, moderators of Thursday Musing since the very beginning, and we are continuing. Both of them are professor of psychiatry and deep Amrit is now EC member of IPS and Alim is the treasurer with all the wealth in his hand. And next slide, please. Chintan, next slide. Alim, next slide. So I have been a lot of pleasure in introducing Dr. Smita Nilkan Despande, a very close, close friend of mine since long. Professor of Psychiatry, sort of the HOD of ABVMS, Dr. RML. New Delhi from July 2004 to September 2018, 14 years. Beginning with systems research in 1988, it's led over 36 research projects in autism, schizophrenia, and genetics, clinical trials, psychosocial aspects, disability and rehabilitation, tobacco cessation, de addiction, yoga for cognitive enhancement in schizophrenia, and implementation research for agencies such as NIH, WHO, ICMR, DSP, and DBT with more than 250 publications and innumerable presentations. She participated in developing the Indian scale of assessment of autism, ISAA, recognized by the government of India for certifying disability for autism. She was co-author of a tobacco system guideline for government of India. She was a member of developing ICMR human research guidelines for vulnerable groups in 2007. She is on board of several international journals. She is co-chair of World WPS section on genetics. She is an international WHO trainer for tobacco system and has been to several countries to train the trainees. Welcome, Smita. Welcome. And next slide, please. Uh, yeah. No, no, no. Yeah, previous previous slide. Previous slide. Previous one. Dr. Sudhir Khandalwal, he is also a very close, dear friend of mine. It is nice meeting him today, though virtually. She retired as a professor and HOD of Psychiatry and Chief National Drug Dependence Treatment Center at AMS, New Delhi, and also Chief Superintendent of Hospitals in AMS. Currently, Senior Consultant Psychiatry at Holy Family Hospital, New Delhi. Formerly Chairperson and Board Member of Global Network for Mental and Neurological Health Research. Formerly Board Member of International Consortium and Mental Health Policy and Research. Both above organizations are funded by the World Bank and governments of UK and Western. He has been an avid trekker, regularly trekking in the Himalayas. He has participated successfully in the Kailash Mansurgar expedition organized by the Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India, member of Indian Scientific Expedition to Antarctica, organized by Ministry of Sciences, Government of India, and spent five months in Antarctica. He has been an avid trekker, regularly trekking in the Himalayas. He has participated in Kailash Mansarovar expedition. He was selected for the Indian Scientific Expedition to Antarctica, organized by Minister of Health Sciences. I have already told about this. So he is an avid adventurer, a great academician, and a very well-known figure in IPS and in the psychiatry field in India and abroad. With this, I welcome both the chairpersons, both the moderators. And I will request Chintan to please stop sharing the screen. And I will request our chairperson, Dr. Khandalwal, to please introduce our, to please introduce the topic. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pati. And uh, thank you, uh, Executive of uh, Indian Psychiatric Society for organizing uh, this uh, uh, musings, Thursday musing, as it, it is now known. And uh, it is very heartening to see that uh, this uh, series has gone on for more than one and a half years. 
every week without fail. So it's a, a big credit to Dr. Pati, Dr. Siddiqui and uh, Dr. Patan Joshi. And I'm thankful to them for giving uh, me the opportunity to chair this session along with uh, uh, Ismita, where uh, very dear friend Mohan uh, is speaking. It has always been a pleasure listening to Mohan and I'm looking forward to his presentation. The topic as has been chosen by the uh, organizers is the comorbidity of physical and uh, mental disorders and what kind of challenges they face, uh, I mean, uh, they present before the psychiatrists. Uh, we all know that, uh, we all know that, uh, you know, diabetes, depression, di or, uh, depression and uh, uh, cardiac illnesses, they are uh, seen. We have known this term of uh, psychosomatic since our uh, uh, training days, you know, 40 years ago, we had heard, read, and discussed about psychosomatic uh, disorders. But now the importance of uh, this uh, comorbidity is many, many fold. There are various reasons. And uh, what we know now is that over the last th three decades, comorbidity has increased exponentially. And uh, it's, people say that it's a, like an epidemic uh, proportion. And uh, it is uh, especially in the elderly age group, 60 plus. And it is not to say that younger age group is uh, safe. Uh, if they have a, a chronic mental illness or if they are suffering from another chronic uh, medical disorder, then they are also likely to develop uh, a, a concomitant uh, comorbid uh, condition. Uh, there are various reasons now, as we know from the uh, studies, that uh, one is that uh, the, the success of medication, I mean, success of modern medicine, uh, our life span is uh, uh, um, increasing uh, year after year. But that is not to say that uh, these increased uh, life years, uh, they are adding to healthy life years. In fact, what has been seen in countries like India that as compared to the Western countries, our elderly population, uh, now we are also uh, uh, inching towards uh, mimicking uh, Western life expectancy, but our elderly age group has number of comorbidities. As you, uh, if you have read or gone through the National Family Health Survey, you will find that the number of medical disorders an elderly person has uh, in India is uh, uh, three or four medical disorders if an elderly person would be having. And on top of that, there could be a psychiatric disorder. So uh, this, this is one, then the demographic changes, as I said. And what we are seeing now is the unhealthy lifestyle. You know, obesity is so rampant and it has started right from young age. Uh, very faulty uh, habits, no exercises, uh, very erratic sleeping hours, uh, unnecessary screen time. And also what is the uh, bane of the uh, modern uh, living is the pollution. And now the pollution is coming uh, and hitting us uh, in a very uh, significant way. And it is possible that the, all the pollutants like India, so many cities of India, they, they rank very high in the list of, uh, in the hierarchy of most polluted cities in the uh, world, which is quite shameful, but it's a fact. And that the pollution or the pollutants, they also affect our physical as well as our mental health. And when we say about comorbidity, it doesn't mean that there are two illnesses which are existing together, depression or cardiovascular disorders. With, together when they're there, uh, they uh, worsen the prognosis of the other. And that is the challenges. And many times, if we are not careful as psychiatrists, we, will, we may miss. And uh, so uh, it is important that we remain aware and not only in the elderly group, but also in the younger age group, if you are looking after uh, somebody for chronic depression or for schizophrenia or uh, bipolar disorder. So I'm sure that uh, Professor Isaac will uh, enlighten us that what is the current uh, situation about the comorbidities and uh, how we should keep ourselves abreast and uh, keep our clinical practice uh, tuned to the uh, uh, betterment of the of our patients. Uh, so uh, um, 
but before that, uh, Ismita may like to uh, formally. Yes. Introduce, uh, Professor. Mr. Chintan, please uh, share the slide of CV of Dr. Mohan Isaac and I request Dr. Smita Deshpande to introduce him. Chintan, please share the slides again. Dr. Mr. Chintan? So actually, it is my pleasure and honor to uh, introduce Dr. Mohan Isaac. In fact, he has been a role model for us throughout our careers. And uh, I'm so happy that at least today I was able to introduce him. Uh, he is so modest that he's just written his uh, whole um, slide in just about five lines. And I wish we could all be like that. Uh, so currently, he, although he is at uh, Perth, Australia, but we have the pleasure of seeing him every now and then. He has not lost uh, ties with India completely. He has worked for the WHO and of course, as we all know, he was a professor and head at uh, Nimhans, professor of psychiatry and head of the department at, at Nimhans. He was also the president uh, medical pastoral association. And following upon the words of my teacher, Dr. Uh, Sudhil Khandelwal, I'd also like to point out that uh, our patients reflect society as a whole. And sir was talking about society as a whole, the presence of comorbidities, not only in the, among those with mental illness, but without it as well. And one of my colleagues, young colleagues in uh, Tirunal Valley, sir, I'd uh, just like to in inform you, he has just completed a door-to-door -door survey on precisely this topic. And I'm hoping that he will soon be able to write up his findings and uh, we'll have very recent uh, uh, you know, results from his survey. And as a curtain raiser, I'd also like to tell you that his, his results are also quite alarming. So we need to wake up and we need to understand that not only our patients, but even their relatives will have equal comorbidities and we need to help out both of them. Uh, sir, without taking too much time, uh, may I hand over the mic to Dr. Mohan Isaac uh, to please begin his address. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kandelwal, uh, Dr. Smita Deshpande. Uh, I'll just put on my slides. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Chairpersons, for those kind words. Uh, I'm delighted that I'm again uh, speaking at this Thursday Musings. This is a wonderful platform which has uh, gone on for over one and a half years. 87th uh, uh, Musings without uh, without a break every week this is fantastic of course covid has done lots of bad things for a lot of people i think this is one of the good things that a lot of us come together on thursdays in the evening 8 to 9 30 discussing number of things uh, and also it's also on the lighter side during the discussion we get to interact with people so this is a wonderful platform and uh, my compliments to the organizers for uh, their uh, uh, discipline uh, in holding it without a fail. And they have been wonderfully uh, good, educational, and widely attended. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, before I begin, I would like to say a couple of more things. Uh, Dr. Khandelwal has, uh, you know, given a broad introduction to the topic of comorbidity. In fact, this is a problem. Uh, not only I mean, of course, about the age of 60, but in India, we find that from the age of 35 or 40, people have multiple problems, diabetes, depression, hypertension, etc., etc. So the topic has been well introduced. But one of the reasons why I chose to talk about this is, uh, and I, I had discussed this with Aline, uh, I have been part of a World Psychiatric Association Action Working Group on Comorbidity. Uh, in fact, both people who have listened to uh, Afsar Javid, who is the current uh, president of the World Psychiatric Association, one of the few uh, item uh, topics that he has chosen as his priority areas for action during his presidency is comorbidity. And uh, he kindly included me in the action working group. The action working group is chaired by Dr. Norman Sartorius, and there are some eight, 10 people 
uh, who are members of that, which includes uh, Giovanni Di Garolamo, Oye Gureje, Vikram Patel, and many others. So about uh, three weeks ago, we had a course, a brief uh, two and a half to three hour course on comorbidity. It was organized by the WPA and it was widely attended by various people. It was an international webinar. And I also had the opportunity to initiate the discussion. Uh, you know, I began the uh, uh, sessions during that uh, uh, course. Uh, and so what I'm going to present today is largely what I had presented at that time with, of course, some changes and modifications. Uh, you know, uh, many people may know about uh, a, a very influential editorial, which uh, Dr. Graham Tornikoff wrote several years ago in 2011. And he talked about the scandal of premature mortality. Uh, he was talking about uh, people with a mental disorder dying 10 to 15 or 20 years earlier. Uh, so I would be, while of course there are different aspects to this comorbidity, and I'll show you that in a slide or two later, but I would be largely talking about uh, people with mental disorders having physical comorbidity. Now, before I go into the topic, uh, let me remind all of us that today is the World Health Day, today is 7th April, all of, from 1950, all over the world, 7th of April is observed as a World Health Day. Each year they have a theme. It is to bring attention to various health issues which the whole world is facing. Every year there is a theme. You know, this year, the theme is our planet, our health. This is just for information. If you're having a talk or a webinar on 7th April, without referring to the World Health Day, it would not be appropriate. And uh, many of you may have participated in various programs all through the day uh, across, uh, uh, you know, the different states and the country. There have been different programs uh, uh, in connection with the World Health Day today. So what I'm going to, you know, whenever you talk about uh, comorbidity of physical and mental disorders, there are two categories that we talk about. Persons diagnosed with a physical illness, such as usually cardiovascular disorders, diabetes, chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder, cancer, and many others. Now, it is increasingly recognized that a certain proportion of them, and not a small proportion, it might be as high as 30-40%, or maybe even higher in conditions such as cancer, there's a greater chance of developing mental health problems, anxiety, depression. In fact, with diabetes, we know that if the depression is not adequately managed, uh, however good the diabetologist is, however good the, uh, you know, the of, uh, uh, diabetic control instructions are, if depression is not managed well, the blood sugar may not get controlled. So is, you know, cardiovascular disorders, we know about myocardial infarction, people without anxiety, with anxiety, without depression, with depression, etc. So uh, our chairperson, Dr. Kandelwal, referred to this area. We know about it, these uh, you know, a psychosomatic medicine. Now there is consultation liaison psychiatry, which is a growing branch of psychiatry where psychiatrists work closely with diabetologists, cardiologists, etc., etc. I would think that this is still not satisfactory. Uh, you know, the awareness is not adequate, but that is one big area of comorbidity of physical and mental health disorders. Uh, today, I mean, it is not my intention to talk about that. That is a large area. There are more and more studies coming. In fact, in the coming decades, this is an area that psychiatrists and physicians will have to work very closely together. Now, the second group is persons diagnosed with severe mental disorders, such as bipolar affective disorder, schizophrenia, chronic uh, personality disorders, etc. They have a higher risk of developing physical illness. So today my talk, because the talk is for about 30, 40 minutes, 45 minutes, you can cover all aspects of comorbidity. And I have chosen to talk about persons with severe mental illness who have physical disorders of various types. And I believe that is a neglected group. The first group gets better attention, although it is not satisfactory, but there is greater awareness. 
people are now seeking there are collaborative clinics etc but in general i would uh, uh, make this uh, very assertive statement that awareness recognition action on co occurrence of physical and mental disorders of the both the varieties is very poor amongst all of us among internists among cardiologists among diabetologists similarly among psychiatrists we treat the psychiatric problem we often ignore the other physical problems there has to be greater collaborative integrated care so today for this thursday musings i will be talking about physical illness in patients with severe mental disorders the current challenges and practical implications for professionals like us because i understand that these meetings are largely attended by psychiatrists practicing psychiatrists clinicians post graduates so uh, and i believe that people with chronic mental disorders are a very neglected group for a variety of reasons and uh, you know when we talk about the scandal of premature mortality it is this group that we are talking about my experience in talking i will be talking based on my experience base of number of years uh, the last several years i have been consultant for an assertive community treatment unit i primarily work with the university of western australia but as part of my clinical duties i do clinical work at a hospital called fremantle hospital uh, at the fremantle it's a general hospital uh, with a department of psychiatry uh, about 50 beds and uh, they have an assertive community treatment team uh, i'm not going to tell you details of what this team is but this is a team which looks after people with chronic and severe mental disorders the most complex kind of problems 20 30 years of illness uh, you know um, unwanted by regular teams regular uh, catchment area teams these patients are referred to the assertive community treatment team for very proactive and uh, assertive management in the community of course uh, 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 australia is a highly resourced country they have resources there are case managers who visit them so uh, i have seen a lot of people with uh, yeah, they are not different from our chronic mentally ill people you know we also have that but uh, much of my talk is based on data and observations from there and the question that i would like to pose at the end what are we doing about uh, people with chronic mental disorders do we have any idea do we have any statistics about mortality we do know that people with severe mental disorders by earlier the second uh, set of experiences in fact uh, smita while introducing me said i've been working with uh, this organization this is incidentally the first non governmental organization in the field of mental health this was uh, uh, the medico partial association was registered as a non governmental organization in 1972 and this organization is observing 50 years of this registration today in india we are very proud of having so many non government organizations working on numerous things you know including uh, uh, film dignitaries like uh, deepika padukone has uh, the laugh love live love laugh uh, foundation which is about depression and all that and there are numerous other things dr khandelwal himself has been a past president of the richmond fellowship society of india but medico partial association uh, was the first non governmental organization in the field of mental health started in india not started by a psychiatrist it was started by a gynecologist who had the experience of looking after a chronic not very chronic but a severely mentally ill person discharged from a hospital i have worked with this organization for the last 40 years i was also its president for a number of years but i have learned a lot about not only people with chronic mental disorders but their physical problems now people with mental disorders are getting older and older which means that they have all kinds of problems and uh, problems also due to the second generation medications that we uh, routinely use metabolic syndrome etc i'll come to that as we go along now since uh, i'm talking about my experience also from australia in australia they talk about the mortality gap which is much more popular than the mortality gap of persons with severe mental disorders you know and what is this mortality gap the important mortality gap 
that is being talked about in Australia is the mortality gap between the indigenous population in Australia and the non-indigenous Australians. Non-indigenous Australians are all the migrants, initially from Britain, uh, Ireland, Scotland, now of course, then of course from other countries, all through from the 1850s onwards, they've been, you know, uh, migrant, uh, uh, various uh, periods of migration before Second World War, after First World War, it was from different places, Italy, Greece, uh, you know, the Eastern Europe, then China, Singapore. And one of the more recent migration has been from India. There are a lot of people going from India to Australia. So there is a terrible mortality gap of about 20 years, which is now being brought down. And this is a mortality gap. Which usually people, the indigenous people who call themselves the first Australians die younger, 15 to 20 years younger. We have a mortality gap, the scandal of premature mortality, which Graham Tornikoff talked about, between persons with severe mental disorders and the general population, which is again about 15 to 20 years, depending on which country you are talking about. This is not terribly important, just for you to show that, uh, uh, just for you to know that the mortality gap continues. These are two sets of graphs comparing mortality, life expectancy at birth by sex and indigenous status. You know, this is just to show that this is a gap of about five years, 2005 to 2010, with a lot of effort by government and with the substantially higher amounts of money being poured into the health of indigenous population, the mortality gap uh, is coming down very narrowly. See, it has been fairly stable during these five years. So in 2008, the government took up a new program uh, to reduce the mortality gap. Let me move the slide. I'm not able to move. Let me see. Oh, yes. So uh, the point I'm trying to make is that when you have these kinds of programs, unless you take it uh, on a kind of a mission basis, uh, things will not work. So in 2018, 2008, the government of Australia, you know, took up a program, our health, our voice, our choice, close the gap program. Close the gap program was to close the gap between the mortality rates of people of indigenous background and people of non-indigenous background. And uh, every year, March 17, just about two or three weeks ago, the third Thursday of March is uh, declared as the national close the gap day, close the gap day in Australia. The point I'm trying to make is that you, if you want to achieve anything, you have to drive it in a kind of a mission mode, and then only we can achieve. And I have often felt that you know we in India have been talking about the severely mentally ill during the past two or three years. A lot of talk about mental health and mental health problems because of COVID. That is very good. But the often forgotten group is the severely mentally ill people. They want one of the things, if you notice very carefully about the growth of non governmental organizations in India, while the number of organizations for anxiety, depression, etc., have come up, there are also an increasing number of non governmental organizations coming up for the uh, wandering mentally ill. That means there are more and more mentally ill people wandering. Banyan, we know there are, you know, one of the persons uh, who work in this even got the Raman Muxesi Award last year. So that means we are not able to, uh, excuse me, I'll just put off the mobile. Uh, so, so the, unless you uh, take it in a mission mode, you will never achieve. Now, let me come to that was just as a starter. Mortality gaps are there in different countries on, I mean, it's also good to see whether we have that kind of mortality gap uh, in India. I know the overall chairman of this program, Dr. Tofan Pati, is interested in tribal welfare. He in, organized a tribal mental health program last year. What is the mortality gap between the tribal population in India and the general population is worth looking into. 
I'm, I have talked about that only to highlight the point that we in the field of mental health are also facing a similar kind of mortality gap. I don't have to talk about it. Professor Sir Graham Tonikov of the King's College, whom uh, many of you know, he is a pioneer in community mental health in UK. He has written extensively about various aspects of community mental health. He has worked on stigma, but he wrote an editorial in the British uh, uh, Journal of Psychiatry in 2011, highlighting this mortality gap between severely mentally ill people and the normal people, the general population. He called it a scandal. Uh, perhaps in India, we are not so much aware of the big mortality gap, you know, mentally ill, severely mentally ill people wander around, you know, they die because of malnutrition, they die because of the families just abandoned them. But we have many other scandals. So this has still not been called as a scandal. And uh, my primary purpose of talking about this is to uh, draw attention of psychiatrists to the physical health of people with chronic mental disorders whom all of us manage. It is not only Graham Tonikov, this is a WHO document <coughs> which looks at excess mortality in persons with severe mental disorders. Okay. Now I'll go on to say about uh, what is being done. Just a minute, I'll move my slide. Okay. Now, is this something which uh, is new? I believe not. When you talked about when you talk about mortality of severely mentally ill people in the olden days, thirty years or forty years ago, when I was a student and when Sudhir was a student, etc., we were talking about suicides of people with chronic mental disorders, people with bipolar affective disorder, people with schizophrenia. If at all they died, our concern as psychiatrists were only death by suicide. There are lots of papers, etc., about suicide, how, what proportion of people commit suicide, etc. Then, of course, those were the days of asylum psychiatry. Large number of people were treated in big mental hospitals, such as the Pune Mental Hospital, Thane Mental Hospital, Kilpok. I'm referring to them because they all had 2,000, 2,500 patients. There, of course, people died with tuberculosis. In fact, most of the mental hospitals had infectious wards separating people died out of diarrhea. So the focus those days were people with chronic mental disorders dying because of infectious diseases. If at all, they were under care. And if they are not under care, they were neglected by families, they wandered around, they became homeless, mentally ill, etc., etc. That is as far as our country is concerned. I'm here talking about a book which was published in the 1970s, by, uh, 1980s, 82 or 83. The title of the book is, Is There No Place on Earth for Me? It is written by Susan Sheehan. I'll tell you, it won the Pulitzer Prize in 1983 or so. Why am I talking about the 1983 book? It was reprinted in 2014-15 because it is talking about the issue which is still very relevant. And that is about the plight of people with schizophrenia anywhere in the world. And this incidentally is in the most advanced uh, as far as healthcare is concerned, the country which spends the highest amount of money uh, on healthcare. 16% of its GDP is spent on healthcare, not necessarily mental health. I'm referring to the United States. This Pulitzer Prize winning investigation of problems associated with schizophrenia. The author is Susan Sheehan. It is now available for purchase because it was reprinted in 2015 or 16. And when it was reprinted, it was again uh, reviewed by the New York Times and the Washington Post, etc. This is actually, it is worth reading. It's the real story of uh, a girl. Sylvia Frumkin is a pseudonym. The real name is also now known because after so many years, the family had no objection for, for revealing the real name. It is about her struggle with uh, schizophrenia. Ultimately, of course, she died prematurely at the age of 46. Uh, she moved from hospital to hospital, initially under private care and later under the state care. So, is there no place for, for me? That is the title of the book. Is there no place on earth for me? Is what she actually told when she was being moved from place to place. The family didn't know what to do, etc. Uh, the reason why I'm talking about this book is 
she died prematurely. This is in uh, 79, 80, 81. She died at the age of 46. She was unemployed. She was dependent on welfare. She was obese. She was a smoker. Like all people of that description with a schizophrenia illness for several duration, unhygienic. Mm -hmm. She died prematurely of bleeding ulcer. And the ulcer was not detected. It was said in her file that she was seen by a GP for routine physical examination just less than four weeks before. The, the, this is to highlight the neglect of the physical health of people with mental disorders for a variety of reasons. I'll mention some of them as we go along. Mind you, at that time, there was no alanzipine or clozapine, you know, to blame. Uh, so this is something which has been going on. Now, coming back to Western Australia, some of the earliest studies on this uh, premature mortality due to preventable physical illnesses in people with physical, uh, mental illness was done at the university where I worked, the University of Western Australia. This is a publication called Duty to Care. It's accessible, it is online. Anybody can access it and read it. Anybody who is interested in this area should read this book because it's one of the earlier publications on this topic. Now, of course, in the last 20 years, there have been numerous publications on premature mortality of people with severe mental disorders. This was led by Professor Asin Jablanski, uh, who was the chair of the Department of Psychiatry. Now he is retired, where I work. And uh, Professor Darcy Holman, who was the chair of the Public Health. Why is this an important study? One of the few places, if we all know that uh, the Scandinavian countries, such as Finland, Norway, Sweden, they have uh, health records which can be linked. And that is why some of the best uh, uh, you know, data on use of clozapine, safety of clozapine, you know, psychopharmacology, what drugs are most effective. Most of these have come from, uh, you know, the age records of Scandinavian countries, which are very rich countries, not big population. But one other place, of course, in UK, there is a Camberwell register, the Salford register, etc., which are primarily case registers. I'm not going into the details of what a case register is, but Western Australia, Perth is a place where there is a case uh, uh, register which uh, gives records all kinds of information, health-related information. And what is this duty to care study? It's a population-based record linkage study in Western Australia, carried out in 2000, early 2000. Examined the health experience of 231,000 people in Western Australia, 80% of the 8% of the population, these are mentally ill people. 8% of the population at that time had a mental disorder according to the case register. And this study is a record linkage study uh, of their use of other health services. How many of them were admitted to a general hospital? Maybe for ulcer, maybe for cancer. So cancer incidents, admission to general hospital, and death rate were linked. People with mental disorders and, uh, you know, when you have records which are accessible, you can link these things. Now, of course, we know, you, you know about data sciences, how we are all drawing inferences, which we couldn't using mass data. And there are even courses, a lot of young people working on this. In fact, there's a lot of information available from these kinds of records. But this is one of those earlier studies about physical health of people with mental disorders. What did they find? I mean, I'll not again, the, the data is not very important. The fact is that people with uh, mental disorders died because of cancer, heart attack, other heart-related problems, stroke, respiratory system, etc. cetera. So is always a psychiatrist, when we think of people with chronic mental disorders dying, we only think of suicide. But you see, 2001, suicide is not one of the most important things. People died, and also the difference between general population. In every condition, people with severe mental disorders died younger, a lot younger. So I'm summarizing the findings of this famous study, duty to care study. Mentally ill had considerably elevated mortality rates from all main causes. Their overall mortality rate was two and a half times higher than the general population. 20 years later, 2020 to 2022, these figures are not very different. I'll show you another slide on this. 
the greatest number of excess deaths was due to ischemic heart disease. Uh, lower rates of revascularization procedures in people with psychosis. Deficiency anemias were significant. The, in general, what this, what this study conveys is that even if a problem is detected, it is ignored, it is not treated or managed with the same uh, efficiency as it, with, as it is with the general population. You tend to ignore that. High risk for all types of injuries, drug-related poisonings, injuries, etc. Now, nearly 15 years later, uh, the same team, David Lawrence, along with two other uh, uh, co-workers, uh, looked at a similar kind of thing. This, was a this is published in the British Medical Journal in 2013. It is talking about the continuing scandal of premature mortality. Retrospective analysis of population base registered between 85 and 2005. They compared trends in life expectancy for psychiatric patients with general population uh, in Western Australia. What they found was with all these new, uh, you know, the, the, the programs and project increase, budget, etc., life expectancy gap had in fact increased from 13.5 years to 15.9 years. The gap is that is if the general population dies at a, their, their life expectancy at a certain age, people with mental disorders die so many years younger. And compared to uh, earlier period, there was increase in the gap of, uh, uh, you know, life expectancy between people with mental disorders and general population. Now, so I have presented the problem. Now, how do you deal with this? Who is responsible for providing? Many of these things have become much more relevant because we are much more widely using clozapine, olanzapine, and many of the drugs which have a tendency to uh, cause disturbance in lipid metabolism, uh, cause disturbance in uh, uh, you know carbohydrate metabolism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, who is responsible for providing overall physical checks for persons with mental illness? Is it the psychiatrist? Is it GP or both? Uh, 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 you know, I'm talking about the Australian context or Western context where there are GPs everywhere. And there is, even today, a lack of clarity. The psychiatrist says, you know, I've been, I have thrown away my stethoscope uh, uh, two or three years after I finished my MD in psychiatry or my college. I don't. I mean, that is not my job. I'm trained in, uh, uh, you know, studying the mind and of course, although the influence of psychoanalysis has not been there in our training in the past 20 plus years, uh, we don't take pride having a stethoscope around our neck or examining the patient. Even, uh, you know, I left, retired from the man several years ago. But the, the consultant had to insist with the registrar to do a physical examination, and that was often of the person who is being admitted, and that was often thought of as a burden. What about the GP? We send the people with, uh, you know, diabetes and uh, poorly controlled uh, blood sugar to a GP. Uh, at least in my experience in Australia, GPs are not very keen on managing these people with psychosis. And uh, when you work with them, you ask them, oh, doctor, I don't know. I mean, I have no problem. But my other clients don't very much like these people coming and sitting. Some of them smell. They are not taken bath for several days. I'm talking about a Western setting where much better resource, much better community care is going. Maybe 5%, 10% of the GPs may do something. Others are not even interested in taking referrals of people with psychosis having a coexisting physical problem. There have been projects where integrated collaborative care between GPs and psychiatrists have been tried, you know, GP liaison services, etc. But of course, if it is done as a project with additional funding, it works well. But it doesn't work very well in the routine. Whenever you introduce it into a larger health system, there are problems. Contributing to the life expectancy gap being maintained or increasing. And this is because there are skill gaps for both psychiatrists and GPs. Of course, if somebody asks me to manage and control the uh, blood sugar of some, one of my patients who is on clozapine, well controlled, he has good insight, he comes for follow-up, etc. But in the process, he's also developed uh, uh, diabetes 
I would not know. I, I mean, I might know what I learned several years ago in my MBBS. I have not taken particular care to advance my knowledge of managing hypertension, uh, diabetes, etc., etc. Uh, so the skill gaps are there for both psychiatrists and GPs. GPs, yes, he doesn't know. I mean, I will later on tell you about a message I got from one of my former patients. Uh, uh, in fact, I must compliment. She has come to know about, she is not a doctor, but she is written to send to me a mail saying, I'll be listening to you because it is my brother's story, whom I've been looking after. She is incidentally the uh, office bearer of a family self-help group in Bangalore called Amen. And uh, about two hours before I came, a doctor, she's somebody whom I've known, I used to manage her brother a long time ago. She wrote to me uh, about her experience, how close-up in was reduced. The physician refused to talk to the psychiatrist and she had to pick up a racket to say that, ask the physician because the blood counts had come down. And it's a long story. Uh, uh, I'm happy that the news about Thursday musings have gone to family care groups and some of them log in and attend to these lectures, which is very good. Uh, and this talks about the skill gap on either side. I mean, uh, uh, if uh, the blood count of, of somebody who is being treated very well with close up in goes down and they go to a hematologist or an internist or somebody, they don't know what this close up in does for him. Uh, they will reduce, they will of course know the hematology of this stop medication, maybe cause a relapse even before they are See, the point is that collaborative care and talking to each other is lacking, which causes a lot of problems. Now, wh wh why, why do these things occur? We all know, but I'm just uh, listing some of them. It's a combination of biological, psychosocial, environmental, and behavioral factors may be involved. I mean, the question where people with schizophrenia develop diabetes more frequently has been there much before clozapine and olanzapine were discovered. I think there are papers even before the discovery of chloroplomus about coexistence of diabetes. So the point I'm making is biological, psychosocial, environmental factors, behavioral factors, all these contribute to this complex interplay of physical disorders and mental disorders. Uh, then of course there are the problems people with mental disorders have higher rate of smoking. In fact, uh, you know, a long time ago when I was working in the man's you know, I used to tell my residents all that you need to look uh, to know how long the uh, schizophrenic illness is to look at their fingers. I mean, if it is tobacco stained, that means say somebody who has a problem because he keeps on smoking till the last puff in the process burning his, uh, you know, fingers and there would be a black uh, 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 stain, stained fingers. High rates of smoking, alcohol, other drug use, in other countries, uh, for example, in Australia, people with the mental disorders use cannabis, uh, amphetamine, so various kinds of drugs. Reduced physical activity, sedentary behavior, all of these are factors which contribute to many of the problems even for people without mental disorders. But with mental disorders, these are added factors, poor nutrition. In the West, they say they eat junk food. In fact, uh, in one of the hostels where I used to visit in Australia, where people with chronic mental disorders stay. Of course, they have the hostel food, but it may not be the best. These are run by, you know, with the little government funding. They all go to the nearby bakery around 4 o'clock or 4.30 when the bakery closes. And whatever food is unsold, or sweet foods, you know, very, very sweet uh, kind of uh, things, uh, uh, pastries, etc., are sold at a cheaper price because they want to clear off and this is what they eat. And of course, junk food, you know, you, uh, you don't have a, a, a good food, healthy food is expensive. Many of these people on uh, disability pension, the cheapest food available is maybe some burger from one of those chains, etc. And uh, uh, that is why now, of course, those chains are advertising that they have fresh vegetables in them, subway, etc. But the problem is poor nutrition and junk food eating poor socioeconomic status, all these contribute to this. Uh, then, of course, another major group is impacts from treatments. Polypharmacy, I don't have to go into that, multiple antipsychotic medications, prescribing practices of doctors. I'm not uh, particularly talking only about our country. These are problems all over the world. 
adverse effects of psychotropic medications, obesity, metabolic syndrome, cardiovascular disorder. Then there is something called diagnostic overshadowing. Now, this is very simply, this is something, this is a crime committed by people on both sides. That is psychiatrists as well as physicians. When a patient with a psychiatric problem who is under our care talks about a physical complaint, symptom, we don't take it very significantly. After all, he's somebody with a delusion, subthreshold, this, that, etc. It is never taken serious. Now, if they genuinely have a, let's say, an abdominal discomfort or something, even if they go to a GP, they say, oh, he's somebody with a chronic schizophrenia on medication. You underplay the symptom. This is what is called diagnostic overshadowing. Deficient skills and competencies of mental health staff in managing physical illness. I mean, uh, uh, I regret that I cannot manage these days. The longer you are away from your initial medical training, unless you have CPDs on some of these things, you will not be able to keep up uh, you know, your competence in managing all these things. Persons with illness have impaired insight. They are reluctant to seek help for both physical and mental illness. They are non-adherent with treatment. Then the geographic separation. The mental health centers, not very close to, in many places, even where in my hospital, we take pride saying that this is a general hospital psychiatry unit. But our psychiatry block is a W block, which is at one extreme end. Uh, and while the psychiatry uh, ward was started to destigmatize the mental hospital when they closed down 20, 30 years ago, uh, they thought that the stigma will come down. But now going to W block itself is stigmatizing. The stigma is worse than going to the old mental hospital. So these are problems. Lack of clarity about who is responsible for the monitoring. Uh, I'm speaking from a Western, uh, uh, you know, better resource country perspective. These problems have not yet come to our country. I told you the scandal of, scandal of premature mortality of severely mentally ill is not yet a scandal in our country because we have to manage bigger scandals, uh, attitude of the healthcare staff, discrimination, absence of integrated health policy, all these things contribute. So the Royal Australian New Zealand College have deliberated on this. They have brought out a guideline, keeping body and mind together. They have given strict instruction to psychiatrists, even about prescribing, how to prescribe. If it's a first episode psychosis, you have to take the side effect profile into uh, it's a different matter that the pharmaceutical companies make use of this to say this is better than that. That's a different matter. But I'm talking about uh, from the professional evidence-based perspective, and this is a guideline keeping body and mind together, something which uh, the RA and ZCP, the Royal Australian New Zealand College, has brought about. Now, uh, patient and illness challenges. Why is that we are not able to bring down this uh, gap? There are numerous challenges. Our patients have no insights, mental health care provider related factors. We are not terribly interested in managing uh, diabetes or cancer in our patients. Physical health care provider related factors, they are ne neither are they interested. Systemic challenges, stigma, you know, uh, failure to provide equal care, uh, system fragmentation and role confusion. Uh, there are lots of things, but uh, you know, who goes where, who, whose job is it primarily to, uh, you know, order for the x-ray and look for, uh, you know, any other pathology when, uh, when one of our patients is coughing more than usual. And uh, now with all the guidelines, we have introduced mandatory screening in highly resourced countries. But the problem is after screening, we leave it at that. So that's why the current slogan is don't just screen, intervene. I'm coming to the last part of my. So what do we need? How to improve the physical health? Tackle stigma and discrimination, rational management of psychotropic medication. I'm not saying don't use clozapine or relanzapine. The clozapine is still the gold standard for treatment resistance, schizophrenia, proportion of people. But we have to be careful in uh, measuring weight, measuring, you know, waist circumferences, uh, talking to them about healthy eating, about uh, uh, the uh, usefulness of uh, uh, exercises, 
etc. Collaborative and interdisciplinary care. Very often, some of these, the doctor may not have time. I'll tell you about how these things are attempted in other places. Lifestyle interventions, important of physical exercise, enhance the capacity of persons with mental disorders. You know, there is a whole area called the chronic disease self-management. You teach your patient how to manage. It's already working well in the field of diabetes and hypertension now with the bipolar affective disorder and the schizophrenia we need to try. So in Australia, in the place where I work in a university, Duty to Care was a project which showed this big gap. So government gave us additional funding, you know, to respond to this. And we call that the project, the Health Right Project, Health Responsibility. So what were the aims? I will now quickly complete. Uh, this is, uh, I have highlighted the problem. The problem still remains. We do not know what is the magnitude of the problem in our country because there have been studies here and there about, uh, you know, SCARF has uh, published papers about mortality of persons with severe, you know, the Madras follow-up study of uh, Rajkumar and Tara and others. And there are other, in fact, uh, in the man's I've been co-guide of a PhD thesis which has just been completed which looked at follow-up of about 100, 180 persons with schizophrenia. And uh, he has recently uh, contributed a paper about their mortality, about nine or 10 people died. Uh, you know, the average age was 43 years or so, or people with... So this is a problem, but uh, as I mentioned, this is a scandal which has not yet come up to the fore because there are other bigger scandals. So how did the Health Right Project manage this? started awareness campaigns, statewide clinical protocols were produced, health promotion campaigns, recommend for recommendations for, you know, I mean, we had to instill this into our RNZ training program for the postgraduates because often the mental, the physical illness of mentally ill is forgotten. I will only, before I end, I'll talk about two programs, the peer support and the promotion of interagency collaboration with GPs, involvement of all stakeholders. So the peer support program, uh, the basic principle is talking to somebody with uh, severe mental disorders who is on close-up about uh, physical exercise. You must go for a jog or walk every day for 30 minutes. The psychiatrist can talk, but he's not going to do it. Psychiatrist can once in two months measure the weight and tell him, look, your weight is going up. This medicine we cannot stop because that is very important. The only way to deal with the medicine is you know, healthy eating and exercise. Uh, he's not going to listen to us. But he is likely to listen from some other person who is on similar kind of problem, who comes to your follower. But he is following this. So this is he's a peer work. He's a peer support work. Encourage and assist clients to set achievable goals regarding their physical health. Make and attend GP. I mean, this chronic mentally ill person who is obese, you know, who is... Uh, uh, you know, the blood sugar is high, who is not even having a good diabetes control. A peer worker, that is somebody who has a similar program, can encourage him to go to a GP regularly. Encourage clients to independently attend. So the peer support program is something that we have worked on. Who is a peer? What is peer support? Peer support is based on the belief that people who have faced, endured, and overcome adversity can offer useful support, encouragement, hope and perhaps mentorship to others facing similar problems. This is something which has worked uh, in breast cancer, in uh, prostate cancer. You know, somebody who is newly diagnosed with the prostate cancer, he is going to get his best advice from a surviving prostate cancer patient. Of course, the oncologist is important, etc. So the peer support is something which I think in India we can promote. In fact, I have learned some of this from the, my work in Medical Partial Association. So these are some papers if somebody wants to read. Peer support shows promise in helping persons living with mental illness and address their physical health problems. A trouble shared is a trouble half. This is something we try to popularize. So much so now, the government is funding non-government organizations to pay for personal helpers and mentors. This is a program. No time to go into the details. But these are all programs which focus if the psychiatrist doesn't have the time, the GP may do something, but a, a personal helper and mentor is there to help him go to the GP, get the work to get done, etc., etc. There are partners in recovery. Different kinds of programs are now in operation, funded programs. Many of them are with the involvement of general, uh, general uh, non-government organizations. 
there are also clinical guidelines for the physical care psychiatrists i mean if you are following up somebody on clozapine what are those things you have to do mandatorily besides the blood count you have to do waist circumference you have to check the blood pressure you have to check the weight number of things like that often things which we don't know don't do so our university has come out these are all accessible online anybody uh, can access this the co location of mental and physical health care within the mental health care if you are working in a large mental health care setting you know co locate the clinic led by nurse practitioners who links patients to appropriate health care pathway i mean uh, essentially it is bringing the physical care and the mental health care together focus on assessment and investigation of physical uh, comorbidity additional staff a clinical nurse this is how the western world and uh, uh, you know you have for example in our hospital where i work we have started a wellness clinic the chronic mentally ill people who come for follow up don't go to the gp so we thought okay now let us start a wellness clinic at the gp so we have a part time gp coming into the psychiatric setting another room there so the gp measures the weight and checks the blood sugar and advises etc these are my colleagues a nurse practitioner a gp and a nurse assistant i would stop here so peer support work shows uh, promise uh, my these are the references uh, you know i mean uh, on research gate some of them are big reports those who are interested can read this uh, published papers as well as uh, research reports so what i have tried to do is to highlight the plight of people with the chronic severe mental disorders their physical health problem how it is neglected and how it is contributes to premature the, 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 the mortality or dying at least 15 years younger than the general population thank you very much for a patient listen back to you chairperson thank you so much sir over to chairperson for opening remarks uh as uh, usual uh, professor isaac has uh, uh done it very comprehensively in very uh, engaging style and giving us all the kind of uh, uh, reading material references and uh, uh, so uh, I, i think he has covered the entire area of comorbidity and not limited to illnesses but the role of uh, Uh, drugs and uh, lifestyle and environment and behavior i think it has been a very comprehensive presentation mm. uh, um um smita you would like to add something and uh, then we give it the moderators for question answer session you have to unmute yourself smita it's still not um, you you do it yourself yeah i got yes. it done yes. thanks uh sorry for that so indeed uh, sir your remarks are absolutely correct that you've given a 360 degree view of severe mentally uh, ill and their comorbidities and actually what is happening is there's such a sweep of uh, physical illnesses in the entire population that we are in danger of neglecting or ignoring those who are most vulnerable in other words are severe mentally ill and very rightly spoken that in spite of all the talk about uh, mental health being at the center of uh, uh, public health care these days what is really happening is that it is just lip service and mental health uh, gets as little budgeting as before it gets as little prominence as before and because of uh, maybe financial issues the amount of investment is too much the amount of outcome is not much we are in a way forced to uh, neglect our mentally ill but in a way it has also been working partially well because our patients stay with their families and they themselves become valuable helpers even with their limited uh, abilities at least those who uh, have a modicum of uh, response to treatment so there are positives and negatives of both but what is heartening to note is very simple short interventions can make a real difference uh, in the physical health of our patients and that is something that we should not forget 
we must tell them and if we tell them again and again at some point of time the family member or the patient listens and they start implementing our advice as far as having a policy or a big national program is concerned in mission mode or peer group support those are very uh, you know long term goals but peer group support is something that we can ourselves try in our own clinics and in our own work so thank you sir for these uh, very innovative suggestions and uh, we are open to questions uh, which our moderators will uh, take up thank you so much ma'am thank you so much ma'am uh, sir before we proceed uh, i'd like to uh, make two points and your comments on it uh, if we uh, first point is uh, the peer support the training of gps there was a, a government program in lucknow and some of the gps were in the in the government sector the, the pms posting they were brought to kgmc and they were trained in mental health short courses to one month two month courses i after that there was a huge change in their outlook towards mental illness once they are trained so this is after the training the one thing that i surely wish could happen was if psychiatry was a separate subject in ug and it was evaluated by a psychiatry department so when these medical students go on to become full fledged doctors this stigma would be alleviated a lot those thing and the second point is use of stethoscope and all the paraphernalia i think forget bp forget everything stethoscope is one of the most important rapo forming instruments a doctor is identified by a stetho so uh, i before covid i had a policy that every patient i used to take bp myself while talking to the patient it doesn't take any extra time any extra effort just you are uh, taking a bp and it, it takes more, may, maybe 30 seconds or 40 seconds so i recommend everyone use have this bp instrument do not uh, throw away the stetho but rather use it for bp and more importantly for this rapo formation sir your comments uh i uh, have uh, no particular i i i cannot but agree with you fully you have made two or three very important points one is of course you train general practitioners the stigma comes down they are a uh, converted lot you have to of course if you, there are ways in training and i am sure you have done the right kind of training and that's why there was a change if you go as a expert and treat them like oh, you people don't know anything in fact as early as the 1960s professor michael shepard said more people with psychiatric problems are managed by general practitioners than psychiatrists it is even today true you we may or may not agree we see only the tip of the iceberg the more severe cases etc more common mental disorders are seen by gps and other people so having a liaison good liaison on a regular basis i would think that not only one short training but the periodic uh, meetings every 6 months or every you know now and then would be very good so i fully support that second you said that uh, these things have to begin very early things would be much better if they are taught uh, during the medical uh, uh, curriculum i think uh, uh, i attended uh, the uh, ansips and listened to the president uh, uh, talking the presidential address was about psychiatric training you know both undergraduate and postgraduate i think during the current president's time there'll be something i agree with you there is also competency based uh, curriculum the curriculum it's a lot better than before you know uh, uh, 30 years ago the only psychiatric training was uh, maybe one day in a week to visit to a nearby mental hospital then of course it improved to maybe three lectures by somebody on schizophrenia which uh, the student will never see it is not based on what the a uh, new medical graduate is likely to see so it has improved considerably over the years but it is not yet adequate today uh, you know there are uh, uh, 600 plus medical colleges and the law 85000 students pass out at least 85000 people enter into medical schools in india uh, in a year some of them are new colleges so every year that is a potential if all of them have good knowledge of psychiatry of course the psychiatrists may be scared that they will go out the job but i my my feeling is that it doesn't occur that way 
they will have more work because these people will refer more cases etc so they should whether it should be a separate subject uh, with exam yes that is what the indian psychiatric society has been trying for i just uh, heard today from two very active protagonists of psychiatry training and undergraduate and postgraduate i am referring to dr himal shah and uh, dr kishore they were happily communicating to me saying that the ips president has appointed them chairpersons of the relevant committees to promote so i think things will only improve uh, the third point you are the right doctor you know you uh, uh, not just for show you get established rapport with the patient by checking the pp and you will also know about the pp uh, i think that is see like uh, today we are talking about uh, uh, you know telemedicine a lot of people are saying that telemedicine is the new mode where your private industry is investing a lot of money in uh, all this even uh, but this will be only for minor problems in another webinar recently uh, uh, they asked me a question and my i might be old fashioned i am in that uh, age range but i said that uh, the basic uh, the the whole basis of medicine is touching the patient taking the pulse etc now how can that be replaced by a, a online kind of a thing maybe for minor problems for information seeking maybe for mild common mental disorders that might work so people who are asking is this going to stay at least in the united states there are lots of people saying no no we don't have to drive we don't have to wait in the office room even the doctors are saying oh, i can comfortably see but we have to wait and see so i agree with you that uh, you know having uh, any kind of rapport building and if they are uh, say like if you are managing somebody with uh, 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 schizophrenia and on any of these medications these days in my clinic i always i have a weighing machine one of the first thing i do is to ask them stand on the weighing machine so over a period of time <laughs> they themselves remember oh last month it was 95 now it has become 98 now i believe that uh, even forget about chronic mental disorder any of us go to our gp for our own health problem they tell you doctor you have increased your weight you reduce your weight so these things are very important and uh, you have also indirectly told me that you are a very good doctor we check the bp of your patients with your own stethoscope back to you alim sir thank you i like to i like to interrupt sir one minute sir uh, many times the blood whole me measuring of the blood pressure you know reduces the repo because then the guardians will thrust their uh, hands out sir hamara bhi bp check kar dijiye and that creates a hindrance in a place like india alim is very assertive he can tell no and he can charge fees for taking the blood blood pressure i generally can't do that so i have stopped that habit of measuring blood pressure as long as the blood pressure is not little you know very deviant from what it was once yeah. my secretary checks the blood yeah. pressure no no, no. Uh, I, i take your point amrit he he works in lucknow and you work a problem bone issue sir india is a vast country the point is establish rapo in any method that you are most comfortable with and your clientele is most comfortable with sir. is it checking the pulse why is a psychiatrist checking the pulse uh you know from hippocratic days i mean uh, you know the contact what is active listening i mean these are all things which we teach our residents you know communication skills etc so the point is not really whether you check the blood blood pressure the father also will say check my blood pressure you know and this occurs in your own family i mean if you go to visit an uncle uh, who has blood pressure you take your bp up this uh, you check the aunt will come then of course your cousin will come Uh, you please check my blood pressure also whether you, you can charge them also at least alim can charge when he takes the second blood pressure the point is <laughs> no, sir, i don't charge <laughs> don't put so in the trap of amrit so then another another caveat to the whole process of training of gps is i had a lot of colleagues who are telling that now people who have taken one month training yeah. are positioning themselves as psychiatrists trained from nimhans and that is creating a lot of bad you know people are being given risperidone mm -hmm. 4 mg as a antidepressant yeah. people are giving being given sertraline as a anti manic agent so what is yeah. happening is it is creating more chaos yeah. than order that is yeah. that is one part yeah. but another interesting question dr munda has asked is my my teacher yeah. so sir as you rightly said there is a kind of reluctance from physicians to treat physical issues of psychotic patients 
Yes. But mm. contrary to this, there is a tendency that various depressive anxiety somatization issues in patients with known physical conditions being treated by physicians or neurologists with antidepressants or anti-anxiety or anti-manic or whatever antipsychotics. Yeah. So what is your take on this? And why are we so reluctant to treat physical illness? Yeah. Even though we are trained in those. Yeah, things? yeah, yeah. This, see, like uh, uh I mean, I, this is a closed forum, so I can say when I was a young uh, postgraduate uh, trainee and, uh, uh, you know, a faculty lecturer in Nimans, one of the top neurosurgeons in our country used to be Dr. Ramurthy in Chennai, the neurosurgeon, okay? But people used to say that um, much bulk of his private practice, I don't know whether this is true or not, but this is what I heard. Much of his uh, private practice income came from psychiatric patients. He's a neurosurgeon because patients who have depression are asked to go and see a psychiatrist. Not so many psychiatrists, stigma, etc. Okay, neurosurgeon is the one who deals. So the point I'm making is there's a lot of, we are an emerging economy. We are growing, uh, but these are not only in our country, in other places also. So what you're saying are two or three points. One is that, People go for two weeks training, one month training, three months training, and then they become self-styled psychiatrists. Uh, ultimately, I think the answer to this is that uh, it is like uh, you know there is a uh, uh, there is an iPhone by uh, you know the company which manufactured. There are imitations for that. How do people uh, differentiate? It is by the quality and worth. So. My personal response to this is that you don't have to be, how many fake doctors come, you don't have to be, as long as you're doing your work, people will know they will come to you. They might be, they might be causing more problem by giving uh, homeopathic dosages of uh, certain medications, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you don't have to worry about it. I think, of course, government also has to bring in uh, regulations. Uh, I know the programs that Nimans conducts are primarily meant for district level, taluk level, doctors who work in the government service where yes. there are no psychiatrists. And the tele televised training programs are for doctors in Chhattisgarh and uh, some of the places. So there can always be a discussion and debate on, on this. Are we doing greater harm or greater good? Now, the second thing is uh, people, other specialists managing uh, 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 patients with psychiatric drugs. Of course, in every branch of medicine, there will be a certain proportion of people who have uh, coexisting psychiatric morbidity. In fact, uh, Sudhir mentioned about that. I said I am not touching upon that. Some of them manage. Many of them don't come. Many of them know that their problem is psychological problem, but they don't want to be seen as a psychiatric patient. There are numerous problems. So stigma reduction is an ongoing thing that we have to be involved in. But then we know that uh, the real case... Uh, See, when a non-psychiatrist manages some of this problem, uh, using some of these drugs, very often it's like using a placebo. If they have to be appropriately managed, they have to come to a trained person. So, but there are boundary violations. There are problems of various types. My own response has been that we are such a large country, one for 1.4 billion, you know, of during the last two years, people may have had some downward mobility, but in the last one or two decades, large proportions of people are moving upward from lower class to lower middle class, etc. There's greater awareness. Even the number of psychiatrists being trained, the latest count is that it used to be 100, 150, 200 psychiatrists uh, in a year. But the latest count I am told is about 1,003 psychiatric seats are there in about 250 medical colleges all over the country. So more country, more number of people, there will be more. And ultimately people will benefit. It is, it is just like you can't be fooled by a fake product if you are going to buy. If you are investing some time and effort in that, you will do a background research. And I do not think the semi-literate person is a fool in our country. That has been demonstrated by a variety of things, how their wisdom is employed in numerous ways when they are asked to. So I have no fear about many of the things that you have mentioned. Of course, they will be there. They will continue. Uh, after one month training uh, or on an online training from Nimans, they will put also trained from Nimans bracket in the board, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Some of them may do some harm also to the patient. But this is all things. I mean, the government, the current government's policy. Uh, I heard the prime minister speak that every modern hospital should have one wing of Ayush. 
he wants uh, all these under one yes. roof. A number yes. of other things. I am not going into the details. See, my primary purpose was to uh, uh, direct your uh, thoughts on people with severe mental disorders dying earlier because of preventable conditions. You know, which can be purpose. done with very little things. That was the primary theme of my talk. Yes. Sure, sir. Dr. Kulkarni wants to ask in the chat box, is the life expect uh, expectancy different between first generation and second generation use of antipsychotics? And let me add on, uh, when you treat a person, when you don't treat a person, uh, how much is this uh, morbidity and mortality difference? Any any estimate? Okay. Or yes. the very interesting question. In fact, uh, uh, people with schizophrenia had a higher chance of getting diabetes. There are reports of this even before the current second generation drugs or even first generation drugs. So much so, people have looked into possible common etiological uh, uh, factors. That's why I said it's a complex interplay of biological, psychological, social factors. Smoking, overeating, sedentary behavior, all that is there. Between uh, first generation and second generation, uh, there is a general, I mean, there is a lot of literature uh, not exactly looking at the longevity uh, of life uh, or mortality rate, but the prevalence of metabolic syndrome, etc., which are, of course, precursors of mortality. There are any number of papers, and many of the guidelines, including the RANZCP guideline, talk about you know use of olanzapine, its uh, tendency to produce, uh, how do you choose an antipsychotic when there is a first episode psychosis, etc., etc. Now, uh, whether you treat or you don't treat, the over, uh, see, like uh, from Scandinavia, I said that earlier, that that is where you have most of this 20 years, 30 years long, you know, about the safety of clozapine. Clozapine has a lot of problems, but uh, many of the review papers of 25 years plus, they say that mortality rates are better when people are appropriately managed. That means you know, uh, you are not just treating and not checking them. You also give them a complete care about, uh, you know, healthy uh, lifestyle or uh, healthy eating or uh, uh, physical exercise, etc. In many of the uh, uh, Western universities, etc., now there are physical exercise programs run by psychiatry departments for psychiatric patients. Uh, so uh, the mortality rates are better when they are treated, even with second generation drugs. Amrit Prasad Rao, sir, is there. I think yeah, we can yeah. invite him. Rao, sir. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, I, I just want to share with you certain more observations and comments. The observations are, uh, I don't know what others feel, but the residents I came across both as an examiner and uh, also my own residents where I teach the PGCA, they are not willing to do even a routine physical examination. And... Uh, then the most shocking part in the recent times was that few neurologists in our city, Hyderabad, who uh, patients come to us years, you know, and when I ask them, did they do the neurological examination? Very commonly, around 40, 50% of them said, no, they didn't touch me. They heard the story and they wrote, they simply wrote the test. I think we are definitely losing human touch in, in probably doing the things which we should do. And uh, what Professor Mohan Isaac has highlighted is, Actually, we can bridge the gap in our severely mental disorder if we just follow the basic thing. Uh, I'm, I'm sure Dr. Mohan Azak was there when I presented in Chennai about the similar topic. I think he also commented that we are missing the physical illnesses, how to diagnose and all. I think definitely it is a very important topic today. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Okay. Alim, there's I'm a question. Uh, can we tell sir to take that? So, Doctor, uh, what are your thoughts on the CDSMP, Chronic Disease Self-Management Program, okay. the Stanford Initiative right. Model? Okay. So we don't know, we would like to hear yeah. about this. See, the, the core principle of chronic disease self-management is, uh, this of course came from internal medicine, diabetes, hypertension and all that. Uh, the best way to manage somebody with diabetes is to educate him adequately so that he himself becomes an expert in managing his problem. He knows when to increase the insulin or whatever, when to decrease. He knows, uh, you know, he has a wedding lunch where he will eat little extra sweet, then what to manage. 
So the principle of chronic disease self-management, you accept that the condition that you are suffering from is a chronic disease, you have to live with it all your life. Cardiovascular, in fact, there are more and more of such diseases you have to learn to live with. Chronic disease self-management is you can go to your GP, but you can't be, he can't be there to advise you every day. So the GP or the person who believes in uh, educates you. So this is worked out in many places. I mean, a particular Stanford model, I'm not very uh, clear. Uh, I mean, the principle must be the same. I cannot comment about that because I've not done that. But in the field of mental health, there have been reports about, you know, uh, somebody with schizophrenia. Okay, he's on a certain dose of clozapine. Now you have balanced the side effects, etc. Now you have to educate him about when to increase, what to do, etc., etc., about the blood count, monitoring, all that. So he becomes himself an expert and he collaborates with you. I mean, uh, today in most uh, uh, advanced countries, you cannot prescribe a medicine according to your choice. You cannot say, I'm the expert. I know psychopharmacology. Uh, I will give you this, you take this. You cannot do that. You have to give adequate information. It's a shared, another similar kind of thing is shared decision-making. The decision-making is shared. Okay, you take this, okay, you may have a little side effects, you may have this, etc. but this is better. In my opinion, this is it. And the person says, okay, okay. Doctor, some people might say, doctor, you decide. I mean, you have told me, I understand. it. This is shared decision-making. So more and more in severe mental disorders, what is being done, what is being widely accepted all over the world, particularly in developed countries where there is a greater carer and user involvement. Carer and user are politically accepted, politically uh, correct terms. Carer is a family member and user is a patient. To use our own, in our own parlance, patients and family members have a greater role in deciding uh, which medication, et cetera, in the shared decision-making model. And part of that is the chronic disease self-management where we uh, educate our patients. Uh, this can be very eminently done with bipolar affective disorders. There are a lot of problems in PPAD occurs because they stop their lithium, they stop their valproate, et cetera. And it's only when they are well into the new episode that they, they have to be brought. The, uh, the real thing is to manage the case with their good officers by educating them. Uh, I have done this. I find, in fact, a colleague of mine has written a, a review paper. I can send you the reference in the current opinion in psychiatry about three years ago about chronic disease self-management principles being used in psychiatry. Of course, it's a completely different mindset. You can't say, I am the expert. I have learned psychopharmacology. I know everything. The patient will say that I am a mental health expert by lived experience. In the Western world, you cannot take nothing about us without us. So you can't take them lightly. You know, you empower your patients. Uh, my belief is that in India also all these things will come up. Uh, already, at least in many urban settings, uh, you can't do that. You have to tell them what uh, this medication is all about, etc., etc. So my uh, uh, re response is chronic disease self-management is something which works. It's a useful way of managing many people who are stable chronic disorder. I'm referring to schizophrenia, bipolar affective disorder, the schizophreniform spectrum disorders. Back to you. Thank, thank you, sir. Amrit, uh, should we invite chairpersons now? Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, chairpersons, please, your comments. And sir, please, in, sir and ma'am, please include when you join, join the MBBS until date. What, is the, what are the changes that you're observing in this aspect that we're talking about? Because you have been at the topmost institute, you have a vast experience. We'd like to gain from it. Uh, you are asking, you are me, asking now, me or to the chairpersons? To the chairpersons. Chairpersons. Oh. To the chairpersons. Both are distinguished. Both department. are distinguished. <laughs> kindly, kindly repeat what did you ask. Sir, when you joined MBBS and uh, uh, until date, what are the changes in this aspect of uh, the topic that we are talking about? What are your observations? How have we evolved as a medical? Uh, yeah, I think uh, people have already covered it. Uh, uh, if you are asking when I joined, I joined in uh, 1970 uh, at Malanazad Medical College, New Delhi. 
and the change which many speakers have brought out that uh, now uh, uh, it was not that the psychiatrists are not touching the pulse you know many times i i say look uh, i don't have uh, to touch my patients i speak from a distance and i don't even feel their pulse but then somebody else is doing on for me you know the nurse is doing or the resident is doing and every patient has blood pressure monitored and weight record uh, maintained but what is happening like somebody said about the internist or a neurologist not touching the patient and not examining the patient i mean even if psychiatric psychiatric residents is not doing it is not to be condoned but a neurologist making an opinion or a cardiologist making an opinion without a proper neurological examination or without doing a proper cardiac assessment i think that shows about the reliance we have put on the investigative uh, uh, techniques uh, the neurologist uh, immediately writes eeg and the mri or the cardiologist would write uh, you know ce ct and all kind of investigations so it is i think excessive reliance on investigations and that is taking away that human touch human uh, touch which all of us learned during our uh, uh, mbbs and subsequent uh, training period so that is a major change the, the over reliance on investigations uh, smita you have also worked in major institutions sir i absolutely agree uh, what with your observations but we have come a long way because uh, uh, my medical college for mbbs nagpur medical college one of the oldest uh, medical colleges in the country did not even have a psychiatry department when we were there so that was how neglected uh, psychiatry was uh, way back in the early uh, in the late 70s and early 80s at least we've come a long way that people have recognized that there is something called mental disorders and they need to be looked at the next step would be to look at the person the whole person that a person with mental disorders can have a lot of physical issues because of the mental disorders itself and vice versa that people with physical illnesses can have a lot of mental distress amounting to even disorders because of their physical illness so that interface needs to be looked at very carefully i am not saying that we we are not doing it or we are doing it i think it depends on the person because while i was uh, uh, hod and that everybody talks about their own time so i'll also talk a little bit about mine so we insisted that every patient who comes to the psychiatry department at least at the first visit must have a physical physical a full physical examination and a drugs uh, at least a clinical screen on the history because these are the issues which can cause the maximum physical problems in a patient i cannot say that they we could follow them up uh, about their physical issues because of the sheer numbers which come to a, a government uh, setup for follow up but to the extent possible i would like to think that this initial screening created enough awareness in our own residents and in our own uh, staff uh, more senior people so that we kept an eye out for physical illnesses and ultimately it depends on the individual responsibility also the individual awareness the individual care for patients the individual involvement of your of you with your patients as far as the system is concerned as sir was saying the system is slow changing very very slowly we would like it to change much faster we would like to have a much more prominent uh, place for psychiatry in the mbbs curriculum we would like to have md students more rounded off uh, than they are at present and the change will come because i am sure that uh, people like alim people like dr amrit who are young who are the young torch bearers uh, they will carry the torch and uh, make sure that these changes happen to some extent uh, the four of us dr pati <laughs> dr kandelwal dr isaac and myself we have become more like uh, pandits than uh, you know being at the forefront of the war so we will hand over the baton to you and i'm sure that you will be with the changing times you will be much more successful than we were thank you thank, thank you, you so much man
that top line sir any any other yes thank you anyone else who wants to tell something or something okay. <clears throat> and uh, abrit uh, dr smita wanted to hand over the baton to you not to me okay <laughs> <laughs> No, no, to Alim also. <laughs> Alim is a happy man. He has been told youngster. he is young. Uh, Alim Ali, is a happy man. He is Ali, Ali is nowadays very rich. <laughs> so, what I Dr. presume we Dr. have been discussing. Dr. Yeah. Tufan Pati, Smita has included you into a different age group than Alim and Amrit. Uh, you are, of course, always very young. But uh, she has included, uh, including me and uh, so, uh, Sudhir into another group. Uh, anyway, yeah, I so have no objection. No, no, including myself also, sir. I have not been partisan. <laughs> but uh, no, what I really meant was that uh, people like them are much more active in IPS. And of they course. are still, uh, they have that fire in them. Yeah, yeah. So to Absolutely. some extent, you know, we have become more philosophical. And we have started ac accepting the system as it is. Whereas you are still fighting that when you are true. in the thick of the battle. That is true. Sir, Tofan, sir. Okay, my, my take on the thing is that as I presume Dr. Mohan Isaac wanted to speak about the physical comorbidities in mental ill patients, and which is a, of a prime concern because at times their physical comor comorbidities are not attended to, neither by the psychiatrist or through the medical channel that he passes. And this is a great mistake for the patient of the health system. And there is another collateral part of it. There is also psychological problems in physical morbidity, comorbidities, where there is need of consultation liaison. So what is more important to be inculcated during medical education, production of the Indian medical graduates, IMGs that are going to come up, the spirit of consultation liaison should be there. The interprofessional, interspeciality, indifference that is being nurtured, that is the main reason of the problem. If a psychiatric disturbed person goes, even with a cardiac problem, he has to wait for a longer time in the OP. Because he is disturbed, he is disabled, that tendency has to go. We have to be accepting. That is the call of the need of the day. And about activities in IPS, I always welcome that. Stalwarts like Sudhir Khandelwal, Dr. Mohan Isaac, Dr. Khandelwal trekking to Mansarovar still today, and Dr. Andrade can go anywhere. So you can be the vibrant leaders in IPS still now. And Dr. Smita Despande had gone to his chamber many times. She was always busy with liaisoning with some agency rather carrying out a research work. <laughs> I've been very little time for me, even if I have gone from Qatar. <laughs> so you should be there. All should be there. And uh, Dr. Alim and Amrit are vibrant. I introduced them in the beginning. And this has been a nice new area that has to be discussed. We have to be open to it. All of us know it, but maybe we did not look at this from that angle that Dr. Mohan Isaac has highlighted and that is very important and that should be taken home the message that do what you can do and not to do. Thank you Dr. Aichan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'll give the formal thank you before we close this end. So one of the biggest challenges that we faced in uh, COVID was you know psychiatric patients becoming COVID positive and COVID people having psychiatric illness. I think that was a major area. Where I saw people, you know, a lot of, you know, people, doctors would call me up, sir, we have a psychiatric patient who is having COVID, is sick, sick but he's not keeping the mask, he's not keeping the oxygen. And in one or two days, if psychiatric help is not being given, they die, you know, the, the vice versa. So it's a very, very important topic. Now the most, you know, forget treating physical illness. Many of our psychiatrist colleagues don't even ask whether somebody has diabetes or hypertension or, you know, thyroid issues because our whole medication pattern, our whole side effect profile is, is, you know, is adding to whatever is happening. And the fact that people who have mental illness die a little earlier is a very sad thing, but then it is something which we have to accept because many times 
I have lost people and I thought that my medication might have caused the death. You know, we don't, you know, we don't express it openly, but maybe when we go to sleep, we feel maybe, you know, somebody was lost because I, my, I, I gave the wrong medications because somebody had a cardiac arrest when he was on medications. So these are things which we have to work on. Like Alim was talking about the basic taking of blood pressure. I was just joking when I told the people that I hands, it, it, it's a very important part. You know, touch is a very important part of rapport building. Not the inappropriate touches, but the, you know, just taking the pulse or taking the blood pressure or just by putting the hands on the, you know, on a patient to tell that I'm there, that that's one of the most important areas. And Dr. Mohan Isaac has been a very, very, you know, great supporter of musings. And he, at this topic, I, I think he has added another dimension to the whole musing thing. Thank you, Dr. Khandelwal and Dr. Smita. You've been brilliant and great. You, have, you know, you have been just the, the best chairpersons we would have had on this great occasion. Tofan sir, as always, he comes, speaks little less, but he summarizes everything well. Alim has been brilliant as always, and I've been a little boring. Thank you, everybody. Have a great weekend. Hope to meet you next time. Tofan sir? Inviting you all to the 100th episode, which is coming soon. Followers and Torrent also for supporting us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Chintan, uh, can Chintan you close down? Close the meeting.